design changed and some of the challenges, some of the difficulties that we met when we were building these things for the first time. Nowadays, everything is simple. What do you do when you do designing and engineering? You have a computer and you simulate it all, don't you? Okay, you simulate everything. So lots of the problems you solve as you go on the screen. 50 or more years ago, we didn't have computers. Everything was done with paper and pencil drawings. And sometimes we would get to the site and we would put two things together and the holes would be in the wrong place or they wouldn't fit. It doesn't happen these days, so I'm just giving you a flavour of some of the challenges that we met. Some of them were engineering challenges, others were unexpected scientific problems that we, we hadn't thought of. You know, the physics caught us out. So, without more ado, crack on. Um, I graduated from Churchill College, Cambridge in 1967, which is a long time ago, and my first job was with the Marconi Space Communications Division in Chelmsford. Now, that's, that's the location of the head factory there. I did some uh, training schemes. They were very good on training graduates because the first thing you realise when you graduate from a university is you go into work and you know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the guy that sweeps the corridors and brews the tea, he knows more about the company than you do for the first few weeks. So Marconi were very good at training graduates so that we could go straight into a project and be useful right from day one. And I chose to go into satellite telecoms. So my first posting was to Goonhilly Downs in Cornwall. And that's about, uh, about 500 <coughs> kilometres away. So it was quite a move. So I spent most of the next year, I was living sometimes with my parents in London, travelling daily to Chelmsford, and then every week or two, or sometimes months at a time, travelling down to, down to Cornwall. The reason we were at Cornwall was that Cornwall was the location of the very first satellite telecommunication station in the United Kingdom. The reason it was built in Cornwall, of course, is it's closest to the Atlantic and has the best view across to the United States. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> let's look at the original Goonhilly No. 1, which was built for Telstar. Now, it was designed by the same designer that designed Jodrell Bank. I'm sure you all know the, the Jodrell Bank telescope. Um, and it was a very good design indeed. Built in 1962, and the particular feature that it had was it could track very low orbit, fast moving satellites. You'll appreciate that the very early telecommunication satellites were in low orbits, so they only had a few minutes to pass across the sky. So that meant that the dishes had to be capable of picking up the signal and tracking it very rapidly across the sky. Um, this was later used, a little bit modified, as we'll see, for the, the first synchronous satellites, which was started off with early bird, Intelsat 1, and then later on, developments. <coughs> and now I'll tell you a little story, if we've got time. That is a picture of the original Telstar satellite. As you can see, it looks quite impressive for 1962, but it was about that big. That's all, very small. There's a, a helical antenna on the top for, for telemetry, so the ground control can actually control the, the operation of the satellite. And then the actual telecommunication ports were as a ring of microwave ports around the, the, the equator. Okay? So there's the solar panels and the equator, and the whole satellite is spun in order to stabilize it. You'll immediately see that, of course, the Receiving and transmitting antennas, that's the, that's the receiving antenna on the satellite at 6 gigahertz and then transmitting back to the Earth at 4 gigahertz. That antenna effectively sends radio waves in a great big fan all around it. Only a small proportion of that actually hits the Earth. So that's why it had to be in really low orbit. If you put that far out in space, it just wouldn't work. The signal would be too small. So it was... It was very much, as we say in England, on a wing and a prayer. Okay? There was only just enough performance for this to work. There is the first Goonhilly No. 1 dish. And you'll notice it has a very, a very um, short quadrupod, four-legged four structure there, and a very deep dish. 
This was a characteristic of all of the dishes at the time. Over in United States, at Andover, Maine, there was an inflatable radome, that's a huge inflatable bubble, and inside it was a very unusual dish. Well, not really a dish, it was actually what's called a hog horn antenna, where the transmitter and receiver is in the cabin, and then there is a section of a parabola there, so that the radio waves come in, bounce off that parabola, and then into the dish, and vice versa. So that was a very strange device. But nevertheless, absolutely huge, and it worked extremely well. So there came the time when the first transatlantic link-up was going to work. Now, this may not work, so let's just see if this... It depends on all the technology working, so bear with me a minute. Fingers crossed. Ah. There's a sound as well. This is recording from the time. Here we are. There's a bar. No. We are at just that's a man's face. There it is. There it is. <laughs> That's the picture. <laughs> the, whole, the whole of the United Kingdom is watching this live on television. You see it for yourself. There it is. It's a man. Mr. Booth, Captain Booth, looking at you. Delicate tuning to hold the top picture. There it is. I, I, I knew that guy, he was a Scotsman called Jock. I remember him when I met him later. And it's held on the right hand monitor, perhaps a little better than on the left hand one. There's the unmistakable image. There is the first live television picture across the Atlantic. Mm with uh, rather less than four minutes of available time left. I'll just stop it in a minute. Uh, yes, you see that the feed was at that point with a very short four-legged four uh, construction. And the low noise amplifier was in that cabin there. So the waveguide came down one of the legs into the cabin and it was cooled by evaporation of liquid helium. Anyway, there's the, there's the dish. You can also, well, we'll see the structure in a minute. I'll just move on, hopefully. Just have to, have to stop that. Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire, messages that forge brighter connections, and emails that get the job done, you need to think about more than just grammar and spelling. I'll leave that running in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Technology, eh? Right, so the construction of this antenna was quite unique. Um, it was basically in the form of a concrete bridge. That is a huge concrete girder, reinforced concrete girder, supported on two legs at each side, and then the whole thing sat on a huge concrete, reinforced concrete turntable, which was supported on rollers around the edge. And the whole thing was driven by huge electric motors, 100 horsepower electric motors, because it was capable of turning round at 120 degrees a minute. That's to say it would only take 90 seconds to move round in a 180 degree arc. Uh, that is really, really fast, especially when you consider it weighs 1,118 tonnes. This is a very scary piece of kit. But because it was built of this reinforced concrete structure, which had very good damping characteristics, it actually worked extremely well. The, the azimuth, the rotation, was by two pair of electric motors driving a huge chain, cobbling chain, around the whole thing at the bottom. And then the, the up and down was a lead screw which was contained inside that housing. So there was a vertical lead screw 
kind of connecting, like a connecting rod from the lead screw to the back of the dish. So it's at there, it's at the horizon. The lead screw will be driven down and it will pull the thing back like that. A little bit like the mangle one, but the other way around. In the mangle, you push up rather than pull. And you can see there's the lead screw chamber there. And you can see the scale of it with the, the ladders. Quite a huge, impressive piece of kit. Now, as it was originally built for Telstar, it had this very deep dish. But by the time the technology had moved on to Early Bird in 1965, they realised that they'd done all the calculations completely wrong. So what they then did was they actually built an, an entirely new, much flatter dish inside the original one, and then fitted this longer legs there. So that is actually the same thing several years later. And you can see that there's a kind of a, a ring right around the edge. And if you crawl in there, you can crawl in between the original reflector and the, the new reflector. Uh, these, were, these were mistakes that were made. Everyone in the world trying this was making mistakes like this, or similar mistakes, or even different mistakes. But it was all brand new, that's what I'm saying. Particularly, they realised that this arrangement gave them very poor illumination of the dish. They couldn't understand why the signal levels were much lower than they anticipated. And so one day, they, they put a big light bulb, a 100 watt light bulb, at the focal point there. They pointed the reflector at the horizon, and then at night, from several miles away, took photographs <laughs> of it. And what they realised, that these legs were shadowing at least a quarter of the dish. So again, mistakes were made, all of them hopefully corrected by this arrangement. But this still had the focal point at the dish, and it still had the low noise amplifiers in the cabin behind the dish. So, early days. I'm just pointing out the same, exactly the same thing happened at Jodrell Bank. That is Jodrell Bank, as originally um, built, with a very, a very deep reflector and a very short spike in the middle. In fact, that, the tip of the spike is more or less on a level with the edge of the dish. And you can see it's supported on a very thin support ring. Later on, it was extensively rebuilt. Again, the same idea. A much flatter dish, a much taller feed, feed uh, tower, and the same thing, you could crawl in between the two. And from the back you can see the, the amount of extra reinforcement that had to be made to support the extra weight, several hundred tons extra weight. So that structure was built to replace the original. So designs improve. The whole of engineering, of course, is a process of getting better, solving the problems. Why did they have the problem of having to move so fast? Well, the thing is this, if you have a very low satellite, if it comes overhead, then your, ele your elevation can follow it upwards, but then it can't go over. So you have to go up and then very quickly turn around and go down the other side. So that's why they had to be able to turn around very quickly to, to get the maximum time. Other people try different designs this is what's called an X over Y mount, and you can see, rather than being that way and that way, it's that way and that way. So that allows the, the dish to point straight up and keep tracking. So it's good, good for lots of things, good for fast moving satellites, but this whole structure is very, very difficult to, to organise, and it doesn't lend itself to really big dishes. <clears throat> so that's just a reminder, I'm sure you'll know the prime focus on the original dishes. <clears throat> and you've probably seen this formula. The gain of a dish is the gain times pi d over lambda squared. And that means, of course, that the, the bigger the ratio of the diameter to the wavelength, square it, you get bigger gain. So that's why larger dishes will give you bigger, much bigger gain. Um, if you put typical figures in for a 30 metre dish, at the received wavelength and 50% efficiency, that gives you about a 59 dB gain. Uh, if you compare to an, an optical telescope, a 10 inch amateur optical telescope, put the numbers in on the wavelength of light, you get 124 dBs gain for an optical telescope. Just as an aside, that. And of course, you've got the frequencies. Now, the frequencies that were chosen originally typically 4 gigahertz from the satellite 
and 6 gigahertz up to the satellite. The reason for that was because of this diagram, I'm sure you've all seen this. The, the Earth's atmosphere is not transparent to radio waves at all frequencies. Below about 30 megahertz, the radio waves are blocked out. There's a window from about there up to about one centimetre, about 10 gigahertz, where there's practically no absorption unless it rains. And practically no absorption from the atmosphere. So the early satellite systems always worked in this region. Nowadays we see that they've moved up to the closer to that end a bit. Um, anyway, that's just another, again, you've probably seen this kind of thing. So, when I actually went down to Goonhilly in 1968 to build the second station for Marconi, it was also designed by Dr. Husband. And it, like, like, just like Dodrell Bank, it ran on rails. So we had a segments of rail there, the central pivot and the antenna mounted on, on, on railway tracks. <coughs> That's a picture from the side. You can see this, the scale of the, the steel girders, the electric motors for the azimuth, and the same idea, there was a lead screw and a connecting rod for elevation. We used, again, a fairly shallow dish with this time a sub-reflector, so we had a Cassegrain system with a feed horn there. Now, at this stage, people had realised that they were never actually going to want to track fast-moving satellites, so this could only move at five degrees a minute. The movement was basically to move from one satellite to another. During the operational times, it would just move a little bit during the day, just to keep exact on track. And there's the Cassegrain focus say and we had a tracking system on the original one we actually had an asymmetric asymmetric cavities in the in the horn which were tuned to the the, uh, the satellite beacon frequencies and we actually spun the horn so that meant that as the that the the telecom signals went through the horn un, unaffected but the satellite beacon signal was modulated by the position of the horn so we could then use a signal from that to derive the tracking error and make sure we were tracking the satellite up and down, left and right. <clears throat> that had an extremely narrow bandwidth of 0.1 of a hertz. So once we got it all set up, it tracked extremely accurately and very reliably. And that's a view from the side pointing at horizon. You can see there's the, the back of the push rod and the lead screw was along there. In fact, in this design, it could not go higher than 45 degrees. It was built facing upwards and the, the connecting rod was in two sections which were telescoped into one another. So once the dish had been built and, and checked at, 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 um, at Zenith, it was moved to 45 degrees, locked, and then the, the connecting rod was extended and re-bolted together. So it could then only move from, from horizon to plus 45. So all sorts of strange things happened. There's a picture of the, of the team building it. Um, Again, just gives an idea of the scale of it. Weighed 1,200 tons, and there's a very young me just there. Look at that, I had hair in those days. <laughs> the overall tolerance on the dish, which we thought was very clever, was an RMS error of one millimeter over the whole of the dish at all, all, all positions. And that corresponds to about 1 50th of a wavelength as you probably realise, you, you measure the, the quality of a mirror, whether it's optical or radio, by the ratio of the wavelength to the error. So, 1 50th of the wavelength error is quite good. So, these were the early days. <coughs> and of course, just like any telescope, whether it's a radio telescope or an optical telescope, there are problems. If it's not, if it's not made exactly correctly, not lined up, the sub-reflector isn't, isn't in line, you can get aberration, and distortions, and all the sort of things that lenses suffer from. And if you, if you haven't got it correct, then you lose signals and you also get extra noise, so your signal to noise ratio is affected. So you have to find a way of testing it. But one, one thing you can do, and we were joking about this with polar diagram plots, um, in 1968 we said, right, we must plot the polar diagram. Customer wants to see a plot of the polar diagram. So we thought a way to do it. Now there were no, there's no eyepiece to look through, obviously, and at that time the satellite wasn't up because we were building it before 
into the stuff so I was ready. So we, we found a place about 23 miles away where we could put a very, very small transmitter. We called it a boresight transmitter and transmit just a few microwatts of signal and receive it at the dish. There we have it. So here is the location of the station in Boone Hilly Downs. And right on a hill, right across the bay, 23 miles away, there was a, a, a tall telecoms tower. So we put a little transmitter up there, started lining up, and we thought, right, this is dead simple. A couple of hours work, move it that left and right, up and down, plot it all out, and job done. No, no way, didn't work. Firstly, we were too close. Even at 23 miles, there was effectively a, an interference between the, the two dishes, the little tiny microwave transmitter dish and our big dish. And it's something called the near, the near field zone. And if you do the calculations, it's 2d squared over, 2d squared over lambda, so that's d squared <coughs> over lambda. It comes to 36 kilometers. So we were still within the region where the effectively the dishes would interfere with each other and it doesn't look like a point source. And if it's not a point source, you can't do a plot. Can you see that? You have to be at least, say, five or ten near field zone distances away for this to work. So that was problem number one. <coughs> problem number two is that we would never get everything set and we would look at the meters. Now in those days it was analog meters, you know, with a pointer. And you look at it, and with no computers to log it, so you look at it, make a note, write the answer down. Oh, and it's changed. Changed. Mm -hmm. A few minutes later, down. Over a period of maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, the signal would slowly rise and slowly fall. And slowly rise and slowly fall. What we were doing, we were measuring the sea level in the bay. <laughs> You see, where, you see where we're coming from. <laughs> the, actually, you, I don't know if you know about Fresnel zones. Have you covered Fresnel zones? What it was, the actual side, the, the actual Fresnel zones and the and the side, some of the side lobes from the antenna were actually intercepting the sea. <clears throat> so we were getting this into it. So that's <clears throat> just a quick diagram. If you have a transmitter there and receiver there, then it's not sufficient to have just a line of sight. You must have sufficient room for the so-called Fresnel zones. When they're designing microwave links, they always make sure that there is a clearance halfway which enables this to happen. If you were to put a hill right up to there, it would severely affect the performance. Even if you can actually see line of sight, the, the waves effectively have to occupy that zone called the Fresnel zone. And we were in, we, the sea was in there. <clears throat> you get the idea. So as the time goes up and down, the path length changes, so you get interference. So, another thing, okay, even when we go, oh, well, we can't do that, we can't do this. Sometimes we would set the equipment up at night, particularly, and the, all the meters would be doing this. And they would do it for a few minutes, maybe an hour, maybe all night practically. One or the other, all the signals levels would be flickering up and down. We couldn't work this out either. Eventually, the penny dropped, as we say in England, because what we found close to here, we realised as we drove past every day, was the Royal Naval Air Station at Caldrose. And these people specialised in air sea rescue helicopters. So during a lot of the night time, they would send helicopters out on exercises all around Penzance Bay. And if the helicopters were even within half a mile of the path between the, the two, we would get reflections and scatter from the dishes. It was really amazing just how bad all, the, all this was and how, how big a blow it was to our confidence, as you can imagine. So, <coughs> that's a picture of that's the station and that was the air station. Right, getting quickly on. Um, so, we, we just cracked on. Eventually, they did launch the satellite and we were able to do a few polar measurements from the satellite directly, because at least the satellite's far enough to wait to be a point source. <coughs> we handed over on 5th of November 1968. I put exclamation marks there. Um, may, maybe this doesn't apply to, uh, to audiences outside United Kingdom, 
but the 5th, Nove 5th of November is our fireworks night when we celebrate the plot to blow up the Parliament. So <laughs> it was very appropriate to hand over on that day. <clears throat> so the next one, we went to Bahrain, and this, by this time, Marconi's themselves had come up with a design, completely different, absolutely different speed. A concrete tower, a steel king post, a vertical king post in the throat of the tower, and then a dish with counterbalance weights mounted on it. Very simple, very elegant looking. Um, actually, it worked extremely well in most cases. The big problem we found was that all the equipment for the top had to be carried up through ladders and gangways right through the middle of the dish, which was quite a problem, and we overcame that later, as you'll see. <coughs> the customer, Cable Wireless, wanted proof of the performance, so we tried to do the, the boresight trick again, but it was worse than ever because this was only about 10 miles away, so we knew that was, wasn't going to work. But nevertheless, we persisted. We bolted a small dish onto the top of um, a, a tropospheric scatter tower, powered it up, but we, somebody had specified the wrong cable, and the cable radiated as much signal as the dish at the top. So rather than getting a nice circular polar diagram, we had an elongated polar diagram, because it didn't matter where you went in elevation, you could pick up a signal. So you can see we're really on a hiding to nothing with all this. And then another time, when we did, when we did try to get some measurements of our rain, it looked as if the, the polar diagram was coming out like that because we went on the satellite at 60 degrees elevation. And when we plotted it, it came out like that. It should be like that as a polar diagram. Now, I was quite pleased because personally, I remembered to remind the, chief en the other chief engineer, I was only a junior at the time, I reminded him of the secant correction problem. Because if you <coughs> have an azimuth, uh, elevation over azimuth antenna, and you point it up at 60 degrees, then if you move uh, say, uh, one degree in azimuth, you're only actually moving the beam at this ele elevation by half a degree. You have to use the, the, the secant, one over cosine of the angle, to correct it. So <coughs> that's where we, uh, that's where, so I was quite pleased with my own little uh, success on that. <coughs> There's me as well standing, well, a friend of mine is, Colin is driving the antenna, and the very first time the satellite was acquired for traffic. I'm quite pleased about that, 1969. We went on to Kenya, where the similar design was built. You see the tower and the antenna, but now we have a lift shaft and an air-conditioned cabin on the top. <laughs> and this was luxury, because you could just take your equipment up onto the balcony, step into the lift, up to the top, into the air-conditioned cabin, so that all of the low-noise amplifiers and all the tricky stuff was in a beautiful air-conditioned, weatherproof cabin and it was very nice to, to do. And you'll see that that mountain in the background <coughs> is actually Mount Longanot, and it's a dormant volcano. And that ridge of hill here, which goes to within about half a mile of the site, <coughs> is actually uh, a lava flow from the last eruption about 400 years ago. So if ever this erupts again, it's going to take out the Earth station. But we won't be here to see it, probably. <coughs> we tried the same things again, the bore site, um, <clears throat> this is in the Rift Valley, the Great African Rift Valley. Here is a, a, an escarpment wall here, which is nearly a mile high. From there up to there is about a mile high, escarpment on that side, and similarly that side. So we, we put a transmitter up on a suitable tree, up on the hills the other side, and that's about 25 miles away, but it was still not sure. And the worst thing was, what the team went out to fit this and they left the stuff bolted to the tree overnight, and when they came back in the morning, all the copper cable had gone <laughs> and stolen. <coughs> so, how did we solve this? Well, we solved it. I didn't solve it. I wish I'd thought of it. We did radio astronomy. Why not better to use a dish for radio astronomy? So actually, Longenot, in 1970, was one of the first dishes to do a, a kind of a, a, a quick exercise in radio astronomy. It was fairly common later on. <clears throat> because after all, radio sources are measured in units called Janskis, after Carl Jansky, the pioneer of radio astronomy, and you can get uh, suitable books and data sheets where you can find the intensity, uh, the flux density for the radio signals from any object at any frequency. So all you need to do is locate one of those, 
make the measurements and you can check everything's working correctly. So very briefly, we went through it, we located radio sources Cygnus A and Cassiopeia A, which that's the view from August 1970. I put the planetarium program to the very date and the location. So that's exactly how the skies would have been on that particular day. And so we did some radio astronomy and we were able to prove that it's working. I'll just skip over that. Um, it was a little bit hit and miss, so what we had to do was to calibrate a chart recorder by introducing suitable decibel steps from an attenuator. And then we would drive across the signal, across the source, and by measuring the distance between the, the peak of the signal sought from the radio source to the noise level, we could check that the antenna was working correctly. So that was a bit of fun, and we were very pleased because we officially got the best figure in the world at the time. Well, that's the low noise amplifiers, helium cooled low noise amplifiers. We got the best GOT in the world at the time. It was 41.3, and that was just a fraction of a decibel above any of the other uh, antennas at the time. Two reasons for that it was a very good design, very well engineered, and plus we were in a very good site. We were at 6,000 feet above sea level and in the Rift Valley, so there was no interference from, from nearby. Right, and that's just a quick check calculator. So, <clears throat> and then I'll just skip through this. That's an actual picture of the spectrum analyzer showing the downlink from the satellite when we finished. So that's the, the downlink to two 250 megahertz wide transponder channels, beacon in the middle, and then the, each spike. Each spike represents a particular station around the world. So that was quite, quite fun to see that. Uh, now, you can see what's happened here that <coughs> As in the early days, Marconi and all the other people doing it, NEC, Mitsubishi, American, Philco, Ford, TIW, all these, everyone was making the same mistakes. But within about 1975 onwards, by 1975 onwards, most of the problems had been ironed out. And they mostly settled on a kind of a standard design, and it was called the Standard A. A lot of them were made by Mitsubishi, and here's one in Riyadh that I actually worked on briefly to solve a problem and it's a completely different looking design. That's a picture of one of the, one of the dishes at Goon Hilly Downs, and it has what's called a beam waveguide. You can see it looks completely different, and there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on at the back. There's the control building under there. If you, look in, if you take a photograph, you can see there's this large tubular structure that comes from there and goes up to the back. And that's called a beam waveguide. This is a simplified version of it, believe it or not. So the, the radio waves come in down this big hole and they bounce off a series of reflectors going through several focal points until it gets down to here. So the beauty of this design is you can put all of your radio equipment and all your electronics in the building immediately under the antenna. So short cables, short runs of waveguide, really much easier to use. And that's the design at the, the Ghana uh, telescope we visited a short while ago. <clears throat> so, why did our stations become obsolete? Well, technology moved on. Remember, that's Telstar, 1962. Early Bird, 1965, was the first geosynchronous satellite, and that was it was still spin stabilized, so it spins about its axis, but it has an antenna that points towards the Earth. So there's a motor on the satellite that drives the antenna in the opposite direction so that the antenna keeps pointing at the Earth even though the satellite's spinning. And that was a big improvement because suddenly you can use much more directional antennas. You're not wasting the signal. So we go from early birds, Intelsat 1, uh, Intelsat, I think that's Intelsat 3, which is a bit bigger, Intelsat 4, which was the satellite we worked to originally in, in Kenya in 1970, and then, of course, we jump ahead. Intelsat 35, look at the size of it. It's absolutely huge, full of different antennas with the ability to focus beams on all different localities. So the signal levels are much greater, as well as having huge solar panels to give a lot of power. So, <coughs> a nice little thing there. Intelsat 1, 2, 3, 4, 4A, and a man. And then Intelsat's up to 30, the latest one I saw was 38 when I checked last night. 
<coughs> what happened, of course, was that given the fact that the satellites are now much more powerful, much more sophisticated, you know, a lot more processing on the satellites, the frequencies moved up to much higher frequencies, shorter wavelengths. That meant the dishes could be a lot smaller for the same performance, uh, and again, uh, be because the satellite, because the satellite was able to pinpoint different areas of the of different zones on the ground, the signal level would go up even even tens of dBs more than that. So you have a really small dish capability. You are more susceptible to the weather, and of course. Uh, we, we, can, we can ask Ricardo to explain about the losses at different bands. So originally we were working in the C band, but now satellite technology has moved up. Um, what's the highest frequency you use at? Uh, we're now in the KU band. Yes, KU so band. you're in you're you're the KU band. Yeah, in the KU. Yes, yes, so the KU. But there are some specialist applications which go up into K band and even KA band, as we talked about. You have problems with the weather, but of course you've got so much more capability with the power, you can overcome this. So that's why these lovely standard A Earth stations, all of them about 30 or 32 meters across, are superfluous. So, <clears throat> remember Goon Hilly 2, the one that I helped to build? Well, in 2006, they took a big grabber to it and just ripped it to pieces and scrapped it. They had a big problem though because the building here had been insulated with a kind of an asbestos loaded polyurethane foam and asbestos is very hazardous uh, so when they dismantled it, it was a lot of asbestos dust so eventually they had to put a big polythene plastic tent over the whole of what was left and dismantle it that way. Uh, same thing happened to most of the Marconi stations that was what's all left of the Barbados station in 2008 when I visited uh, just, just, a, just a concrete tower and a selection of scrap metal lying around it. So, that's a sad end for lots of these dishes, but not all of them at that end. Uh, oops, what happened? So, here we have the one that we visited uh, a month or so ago. That is a, a beam waveguide standard A earth station, uh, built originally by NEC, I think, and that is now the Gama Radio Astronomy Observatory successfully converted, just beginning to produce some, some work. And of course, at Manga you have your own dish, don't you? Uh, happily, nobody blew it up or tried <laughs> 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 to avoid it. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's a, well, I, I personally, I've never seen a, a dish quite like this before. I've worked on either the King Post ones or the, the, the four-wheel wheel and track. This is a very, very unusual design for me, but never mind, it, it's Italian built. And you can see that it has the usual dish, 32 metres across, um, and the, it hinges about the, rotates about the elevation axis there. And the elevation axis is, is again driven by a lead screw, just like Goonhilly 1 and Goonhilly 2. But this time the lead screw is underneath, so it pushes up and down rather than pulling from the back. So the dish would be lowered. If that telescope's downwards, then the dish would be lowered. The rotation is by a central pivot and two huge wheels. So that's the central pivot and two huge wheels. There's one of them with electric motors to drive it fast. So that's the structure. Looking up at the back of it, you can see that's the extending lead screw. And that's just beside the motors that drive it. And that's a telescopic cover that covers the lead screw. And this is our main point of interest at the moment because it hasn't moved for a number of years. So we've got to be very careful to make sure that we don't do any damage to it. Or I say we, the guys from Cardo and Company, they don't do any damage by moving it without checking that it's working properly and it's, it's not seized up or rusted. So <clears throat> these are some of the challenges. In order to find the position of the antenna, in this case it's fairly simple, there is an azimuth, ant azimuth encoder which is right in the pit in the middle of the, the central pivot. So as the antenna moves round, that moves round with it and that's connected to the ground, so you can measure the azimuth position. And then the elevation position is measured with an encoder there. So it's all well and good. One of the sort of engineering challenges you have, well, it's, uh, the, the, the dish is subject to huge forces under high winds. So if there's a very high wind, you must point it up to the pointed up to Zenith to park it out of the way where it produces where it gives you the least wind resistance and it's symmetrical all round. 
but you have to make sure it can't get away from you. So in fact, there are two huge locking pins. That part is attached to the antenna, and that part is attached to the structure. There's a huge locking pin can be put in either side to lock the antenna for safety in case of the wind. You also want to make sure that you don't drive the antenna too low or too high to damage something. So there are limit switches, mechanical switches, which hit on various little lugs on the structure in various places. That's the, one of the elevation limit switches. And these are the stripers for the azimuth limit switches on the tracks. The final stop is that thing. And you don't want to try to drive 200 tons of antenna over that end stop. It would cause a big problem. Uh, those shows the uh, pumps for pumping oil to lubricate that lead screw. Now here's a little puzzle for some of you. That's a picture of the track. That's one of the wheels. Any idea what that is? Right? It's a big block. Those who know don't say anything. There's a big block with a cable going from it there onto the structure. Any suggestions to what, might, what that might be? And there are several of those on the... Any ideas? What, what happens in a storm? What do you get in a storm? You can get lightning, can't you? Get a lightning strike. So if you have a lightning strike, hopefully the, the current will go through to earth, through these straps. I'm assuming that's what they're for, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's usually a very large, a very large flexible strap that goes across from the moving part of the ele elevation to there. The engineering reason for that is that, uh, well, two reasons. Firstly, a lightning strike, very high voltages and very high currents. If it gets to the structure, and if the only way to get down to earth is through the cables, through the electronics, then that will fry all of your electronics and probably electrocute people and explode things in the building. Even if that's not affected, then you can get, if a huge current passes through bearings, which are um, usually ball, ball, ball races or roller races, you've got metal to metal contact only separated by oil. If you have a lightning strike through the bearings, then the sparks will damage the track and, and spoil the bearings. So, uh, same, the same goes for welding. If you're doing any welding on the structure, make sure that the things are properly earthed so that you don't pass in the return welding current through the bearings. All of these are pitfalls for engineering, as I hope you'll appreciate. So what's the plan? Well, the plan is to refurbish the main dish, the subreflector and the supporting structure, um, overhaul the mechanical drives, and replace the, 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 the horn. Now, we haven't dropped out much on this, but the, the, at the centre of the dish, you have a horn which has to accept signals from the satellites at 4 gigahertz. That's, uh, um, did you have dual polarisation? Yes, yeah. yes. So, so you have, have both polarisation. Yes, yeah, so you have left and right, left and right hand circular polarisation simultaneously. Then you have to transmit at 6 gigahertz also, and you also have to have a tracking signal to track the, the position of the satellite. So the, the existing feed arrangement uh, that we were looking at the other day is a very complicated piece of microwave plumbing, which we'll have to replace with just a straightforward receiver. Um, we need a new control system because although the old system is looking very, very fine, it's really only fit, fit for the museum. <laughs> so sadly, we have to say, modern equipment will be very swish, much, it'll work much better, and we can probably build into a, a, a touchscreen, HMI touchscreen operation, so that you'll just have a, a keyboard, a touchscreen, and a few buttons for safety purposes, so it'll be much simpler to drive. <clears throat> so that's the system. We've got to make sure, of course, that motors and lubrication systems can handle continuous tracking. When, these, when all these stations were built, they would normally be moved to a particular satellite, and then over a period of a day, the satellite would only move maybe half a degree, maybe a degree at the most, in a small figure of eight motion. So you only needed a little bit of movement. So most of the time, all of these old Earth stations, they would be pointing at a bit of the sky, just moving backwards and forwards. Maybe you change to a different satellite, you move it, then you do the same. For use as a radio telescope, you're going to, during the evening, or during the day, it doesn't matter, in the daytime or nighttime, when the, when the object is above the horizon, you will need to move to find it, and then track it as it moves across the sky for several hours, and then perhaps move to another dish, another target, and track that. So one of the difficulties that you might have is to make sure that 
that the equipment which was made for intermittent use in the past is actually okay for continuous use back and forwards. Um, so that's it, so that's it. And of course the other thing is to provide training so that local staff can take on responsibility for future developments. Because um, I think it's very important for, for, well, for any country, if you're going to take ownership of a project like this and, and manage it, you want to be able to do all of the work yourself. You don't want to have to keep calling in expensive consultant engineers uh, from the States or from England. Um, I, 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 I don't think I'm expensive because I'm paid for by a grant. But <laughs> so you haven't paid for this, I don't think. Anyway, so that's the, that's the situation. Um, I've also I've drawn up a block diagram, which I'm about to uh, sort out and present to the, the other guys. And just there's a, the main control cabinet, which will have all of the heavy current and RFI producing stuff in it. That will be mounted on the antenna. Then the motors on the azimuth axis and the elevation axis, they'll all be wired up. And there'll just be a control panel with a touchscreen HMI and a keyboard in an office in the main building. And of course, we'll probably arrange to have an off a sub-office sub here with an internet link to it to drive some of it from here. That's just some details which I want to try to bore you with. So, <clears throat> nearly there. Uh, many thanks for the, the uh, opportunity to talk to you. I've really enjoyed my time here. I'll be sad to go back on Sunday. Um, thanks to Wikipedia for lots of photographs and references, but a lot of the other photographs are, are actually my own. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So how's that? It's about right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Figure out time. Um, maybe you have some questions, and maybe afterwards Manuel could add something mm -hmm. about the latest news about this conversion project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that this couple of, of uh, looking for regions way apart from the equator? Um, if, 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 the, if the actual configuration is possible to observe anywhere in the sky or, oh, well, uh, or have um, some limitations? There, there are some limitations on this particular dish mm -hmm. uh, because as you, as you appreciate, if we flip back to, oh, you remember where I showed you the picture of the rails? The rails, the, the, the rail ends in one place and there's a large gap before the rail, so the rail track is not continuous, so there is unfortunately a limitation. So one of the, yes, something like that. I think it's a little bit like that, something like that, and north is in this direction. Mm -hmm. So we can cover this part of the sky, mm -hmm. but we cannot cover most of the south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and but on this part of the sky, it can cover from well, from the horizon all the way to the top. And don't forget that changes that changes through through the day and the seasons as well. So it's not it's not the complete end of the world. It's not a complete show stop. This is the cover. The area covered by the rail. Are you not the dinosaur? Okay. Uh, yeah, to extend the the, tra the the rail all the way around. Uh, in the beginning, we were not sure about the foundations beneath the part that is, has a missing uh, rail. But uh, during this week, we came, uh, we found the, all the drawings of the structure and everything was really like gold dust. We found because it was in very very good detail. Described, and now we are sure that we can go all the way around without having to worry about uh, the foundations beneath because it's, the foundations are all the way around. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, well, it's not a problem, but it's a matter of costs. Uh, but we're planning to uh, have a full SML uh, coverage for phase two of the project. We have divided our project in three phases. The first phase is uh, basically doing what Rod mentioned, uh, plus uh, putting up a, a 6.7 gigahertz receiver uh, with digital backend, so that you can do on cool receiver, by the way, 
So you can do radio astronomy at 6.7 megahertz, uh, gigahertz, sorry, uh, with this uh, limitations on, on that. Uh, phase two is to extend and have a full atom coverage, plus adding a cryostat and have a cooled receiver. And phase three is to purchase a hydrogen maser to have a, a time reference, a very stable, uh, well, actual frequency reference, to be able to do VLPI. Okay, so that's more or less the, the idea of this. Uh, Rod, I, I will switch a little bit to Spanish. Yeah, okay. uh, yes. No, algo que capaz que para reforzar eh, la, las ideas que, que plantea Manuel eh, y justamente digamos, el hecho de que esté Rod aquí es porque estamos en el marco de un proyecto internacional. La idea es que como hay una cantidad de antenas varias y, eh, en, pro, en proceso de o ya corre convertidas. Y en definitiva, si se alcanzar el proyecto final de tener una distribución mundial de antenas de este tipo, estamos hablando de armar, digamos, el mayor radiotelescopio del mundo, que es tener antenas distribuidas por todo el mundo que pudieran trabajar con VLBI. Y por eso entonces creo que es un proyecto que, no en una escala de, de tiempo de unos pocos meses o unos, o, o unos pocos años, pero quizás... En, al cabo de algunos años se puede transformar en un gran proyecto de punta que es tener un, un radiotelescopio con cobertura mundial eh, para este tipo de, de observaciones. Sí, que hay, es ese... hay que agregar que eh, la conversión de Ghana, la reconversión de Ghana fue el punto inicial de una red africana de BLB. Y en el taller de Ghana, después más en el de México, los latinoamericanos empezamos a conversar entre nosotros y conformamos una especie de por ahora grupo nada más que, que, que intercambia información, experiencia de gente que estamos en esto en la reconversión de antenas y, pero con la mira estratégica puesta en una red latinoamericana de BLB este, y, y como tenemos la mira puesta en ese objetivo estratégico es bueno comenzar a trabajar en conjunto desde el principio porque hay podemos coordinar acciones desde el principio y ahorrarnos un montón de eventuales eh, problemas que pudiéramos tener en el futuro. Este, no sé, uno pone un receptor de tanto y el otro pone un receptor de tanto otro y después no, no podemos hacer el Si lo coordinamos un poco desde el principio, podemos llegar a ese objetivo. Y, y una de las cosas que hablamos hoy con, con el presidente Antel fue que en esa, en esa idea, eh, Uruguay como país, Antel en particular, puede tener un rol muy importante a través de su data center, ¿sí? como hub centralizador de todos los datos que genere esta red u, o manga en conjunto con otra red. ¿Sí? Y, lo otro que y eso fue obviamente algo que interesó mucho. Y lo otro que quería comentar es que, digo, si bien es un proyecto que tiene un componente científico importante, digo, porque hay un objetivo científico detrás, y bueno, observación en radioastronomía, eh, quizás, digamos, sí, y creo que queda claro en la presentación de Rod, es que tiene un componente de desarrollo tecnológico y de aprendizaje en ese desarrollo tecnológico quizás mucho más relevante, y de ahí un poco el interés de Antel. O sea, eh, acá en este proyecto digo, tienen que participar ingenieros electrónicos, ingenieros civiles, ya tenemos un... Uh, we, have, we have some students that are in common between engineering oh, and yes, I see. Yes, good. For, in particular, for example, we have almost a, a finishing civil engineering. Yes. I think it would help us with this uh, problem of the, uh, yes, the foundations. Yes. Eh, así que, digamos, bueno, digo, tiene una cantidad de competencia y obviamente digo, toda la parte informática, bueno, ahí eh, eh, Enrique, digamos, puede también, digo, participar, o sea, hay un trabajo conjunto eh, que va a redundar en un aporte, un desarrollo tecnológico, o por lo menos un aprendizaje tecnológico nuevo para el país y de utilidad. Entonces también un poco tiene esa, eh, ese otro cometido y, y de ahí creo que el interés que puede tener Antel o, o mismo la, la Dinatel, digamos. Manuel está aquí más en representación de, de la Dinatel, 
de la Dirección Nacional de Telecomunicaciones del, del MIEM, que, que son por su sombrero de facultad. Así que eso es un poco, digamos, también el, el, el marco de, de todo esto. Bueno, no sé si tenían alguna pregunta, algún comentario, alguna pregunta específica para, para Rod. I get the most questions have to do with astronomy and not with uh, <laughs> instrumentation. Yeah. But if we, uh, mm. as astronomers, yeah. uh, want uh, to know which kind of observations can you make with such instruments. Yeah, I think, I think that's where we need, of, we, we need Melvin it? and other people. Yeah. Uh, and, and Ben it, from uh, Manchester. In, in Ghana, Melvin uh, had a, a talk on uh, on possibilities of uh, single dish observations, yeah. scientific possibilities mm -hmm. and of single dish at 6.7. And then the main thing there was uh, monitoring of the methanol lasers, mm -hmm. which are at this frequency. And since you have, in principle, unlimited observa observing time, you can do a, 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 a monitoring of those sources. And then It depends on whether you have a cooled or uncooled receiver, if you can uh, measure uh, bright or less bright sources as well. Uh, once you have the infrastructure uh, capable of doing VLDI or joining a VLDI network, the possibilities are much uh, larger. Okay. And even if uh, there are eventually uh, non-astronomical uh, uses of this, in particular geodesy, that you can do. The problem, the problem is that, um, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, you, you, the American, North American geo, uh, geodesy uh, network, which is IBS, International VLBI something, which is only geodesy, they work at, as an expert. So if you want to join that network, you will need a S and or X band receiver, which we are not aiming at right now. But there are other geodetic uh, uh, networks, and they may be uh, geodetic studies that we may do with, the, say, African VLDI network. So uh, it's really. Uh, An open uh, There's the potential. There's good potential. There's good potential. Yes. Mm -hmm. as, as well as potential for people getting involved in the engineering support mm -hmm. on this, because mm -hmm. as I've said, it's important that that um, you know people, people, local people take take ownership and management and, and design and improvements. Um, the, the technology that I'm suggesting using is just is modern industrial control systems which are made made very very well, very very cheaply really by the big companies like Siemens, ABB, Lenzi, Mitsubishi, um, Moog, there's loads of companies that produce really good modular electronic systems for controlling motors, PLCs, uh, interfacing to sensors. All of this can be bolted together and programmed by just a, a, a good person with, with programming. It's not programmed in C, it's programmed in a special set of languages with the catchy name of IEC 61131. <laughs> But it, it's, it's worth understanding because uh, those, those specialist industrial programming languages, you can take, uh, what's the term? I, I'm thinking of an electrician. Who, who is the person that just wires up the sockets? <laughs> electrician, yeah. yeah. So you, you could take a good electrician and train him how to use those programming things within one day. You don't have to have a degree in computer science to understand how to, to make these, these industrial systems work, which is very good, because it means you don't have to pay experts from America to come and sort out your problems. You can do it all yourself. <laughs> Yeah. First of all, excuse my English. No, okay. Uh, I was uh, reading uh, on 
doing a little research about an old NASA antenna, old NASA dish in Spain yeah. that was reconverted and now is used to a high education, to, to in the high schools. Oh, um, it's a, 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 yeah. Old <coughs> NASA dish in Spain that was reconverted and now a, a student from high school can access their. Uh, in a romantic way and, and operate the radio telescope. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know anything about I, that. I don't know those, but there's a two dish. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. And, um, until just a few years ago, I was employed by the University of Bradford. Uh, and University of Bradford was a pioneer some 20 years ago <coughs> in, remotely, in remotely controlled optical telescopes. And in fact, they have a... Um, they have a facility on the Canary Islands, on, on uh, Tenerife, you know, the, the, the island of Tenerife. Mm -hmm. uh, up, on the, up on Mount Tidy, there is a, a, something called the Bradford Robotic Telescope, mm -hmm. which, again, high school students can log in, make requests for observations. But that's an optical facility, mm -hmm. and of course it's much more compact, it just fits into a container. So it was basically built in a container, and then shipped out and put on the top of the mountain. Yeah. So they just connect up the mains and the internet, and away it goes. And twice a year, somebody goes out to service it and <laughs> ch change the air filters. <laughs> My, uh, well, the university where I studied uh, in Sweden has, uh, well, it manages Unsala radio service. Mm -hmm. And they built two uh, 2.4 meters that you can operate completely, completely remotely. And it's not open only to China students. I mean, we can go into the schedule program, schedule a, a time, and, and use it. And they have documentation and everything. And, and do, uh, well, mapping of the Milky Way at 21 centimeters. So, uh, yeah. yeah that, that could be a side project. Uh, and <laughs> Manga has many antennas. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe, a maybe it, could be, it could be used. Yeah, the, I think yeah. <laughs> that's something that to keep in mind the possibility to have something mm -hmm. for for education, for yeah, mm -hmm. and well, in connection with Seibal and all all the other things that mm -hmm. we have in, in Uruguay about this. They right? start uh, the, they don't do the, uh, continuous tracking of the of the radio source. They used to point to the radio source, uh, forward the radio source, and wait. Ah, okay. Uh, then those the the transit, transit of transit, the transit, yes, and the, the, the telescope is not uh, uh, working all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me.